Welcome to Explain, a series of health education programs published by the Patient Education Institute, the leading provider of interactive health education. This video includes general medical information and does not replace the medical advice of your doctor or healthcare provider. If you have questions pertaining to your medical condition, ask your doctor or healthcare provider. Tympanoplasty Introduction Tympanoplasty is a surgical procedure to repair a perforated eardrum. The eardrum is a thin membrane inside the ear at the end of the ear canal. Eardrum perforations are not usually a serious condition. However, they can lead to decreased hearing and frequent ear infections. A perforated eardrum can also cause a feeling of imbalance if water gets in the inner ear while showering or swimming. Tympanoplasty is an elective procedure. If your doctor recommends it, it is still your decision whether or not to have this surgery. This patient education tutorial will help you understand what an eardrum perforation is and how tympanoplasty can repair it. It discusses the causes, symptoms, and diagnosis of eardrum perforations. It then presents the treatment options, benefits, and risks of tympanoplasty. Also included are what to expect and self-care tips for after surgery. Ear anatomy. Our ears are very specialized organs that allow us to hear and keep our balance. The ear has three parts. The outer ear, which includes the auricle and the ear canal. The ear canal goes inside to the eardrum. The medical term for eardrum is tympanic membrane. The middle ear, which is made of three small bones called the ossicles. The inner ear, or the cochlea. The eardrum blocks bacteria from getting into the middle ear. If the eardrum tears apart or ruptures, bacteria can easily get into the middle ear and cause an infection. Our eardrums help us hear. Sound waves enter the ear canal and make the eardrum vibrate. When the eardrum or tympanic membrane vibrates, the three small bones of the middle ear also vibrate and send the vibration to the inner ear. Vibrations sent to the inner ear are changed into electrical signals. A nerve called the eighth nerve carries the electrical signals to the brain, which understands them as sounds. A section of the inner ear as well as the eighth nerve are responsible for aspects of balance. This is why hearing problems and balance problems many times happen at the same time. The eustachian tube is a small passageway that connects the middle ear to the upper part of the throat. When a person has a cold or flu, the eustachian tube can become blocked by mucus or from swelling. If this happens, the eustachian tube can't open to allow air to get to the middle ear. If the eustachian tube remains plugged, fluid from the middle ear isn't able to drain and starts to build up in the middle ear, causing an ear infection. The medical term for ear infection is otitis media. Ear perforations the most common cause of a perforated eardrum is middle ear infections or otitis media. Ear infections are caused by fluid buildup in the middle ear. In severe ear infections, as fluid and pus accumulate and cannot escape through the blocked eustachian tube, pressure builds up in the middle ear. This pressure causes the eardrum to become perforated or torn a little bit. When this happens, blood, pus, and fluid usually come out of the ear canal. That is why it is important to seek medical attention if you or your child seems to have an ear infection. The eardrum can also become perforated by changes in surrounding air pressure, like when an airplane is landing or when a diver is diving. If the eustachian tube cannot adjust the pressure in the ear fast enough, the eardrum could rupture or rip apart. Sometimes the cause of an eardrum rupturing is a combination of a middle ear infection and changes in surrounding air pressure. To help equalize pressure in your ears when you fly or dive, plug your nose and swallow or blow inside your mouth. Chewing gum also helps when you fly. These maneuvers help open the eustachian tubes and equalize the pressure between the middle ear and the outside. The eardrum can also become perforated by accident or injury. This is called trauma. Examples of trauma include slaps to the ear, blasts from gunshots or explosions, objects in the ear such as cotton-tipped swabs. 
It is very important to protect your ears from noise when operating loud machinery or firearms. Also, the middle ear should not be cleaned with long cotton-tipped swabs. Symptoms The signs of a perforated eardrum can be mild or severe. Some people feel discomfort in their ears. Others feel intense pain when it happens. A clear pus-filled or bloody drainage may come out of the ear. Some people feel ringing, roaring, buzzing, or clicking in the ear. Continuous buzzing in the ears is also called tinnitus. Over time, a person with a perforated eardrum may notice hearing loss. When water gets inside the middle ear through the perforation, it can cause people to lose their balance, feel dizzy, and feel as if the world is spinning around them. This happens because the ears also help give us our sense of balance. When water gets inside of one ear, it causes that ear to become slightly colder than the other, making a person feel imbalanced. This tends to happen with swimmers or people who get water in their ears while showering or bathing. Complications A ruptured tympanic membrane or ruptured eardrum is not usually a serious condition. In many cases, it heals on its own. But if it doesn't heal and the rupture becomes larger from repeated infections or trauma, it could have serious complications. A torn eardrum affects a person's hearing. The larger the tear or hole is, the greater the hearing loss can be. Children can get ruptured eardrums from having repeated ear infections. A child who has frequent ear infections could suffer from poor hearing at a critical time. Without good hearing, it's almost impossible for a child to learn how to speak and verbalize different sounds. The child could develop speech or language disabilities. A hole in the eardrum could let bacteria and fungus into the inner ear. This increases a person's chances of getting ear infections. In rare situations, an untreated middle ear infection can travel from the middle ear to the nearby parts of the head, including the brain. This can cause severe complications, such as meningitis, inflammation of the coverings of the brain, or brain abscesses, the presence of pus around or inside the brain. Symptoms of such infections include stiff neck, severe headache, difficulty talking or opening the mouth, vomiting, pain in the bone behind the ear, sudden changes in vision, and numbness in the face. You should see your doctor immediately if you develop a fever or headache or if the pain in your ear becomes very severe. You should also see your doctor if you feel spinning sensations and abrupt changes in your hearing. Diagnosis Based on your symptoms and medical history, your doctor may suspect an eardrum perforation. He or she will look into your ear with an otoscope, a special lighted instrument to see the hole or tear. If the hole is too small, the doctor may not be able to identify it. He or she may send you to an ear specialist called an otolaryngologist. The doctor may order a hearing test called an audiogram to determine if you have hearing loss. Sponsored by the Patient Education Institute. www.patient-education.com Over 5,000 videos and interactive tutorials. Treatment options Small tears or holes in the eardrum heal on their own without any treatment. This could take from a few weeks to months. During this healing period, you should keep your ear dry and avoid sneezing with the mouth closed. Here are some tips. When taking a shower or bath, place a cotton ball in your ear and seal it with Vaseline. You could also wear a shower cap to prevent water from getting inside your ear. When you have to sneeze, open your mouth and let the air come out of your mouth. Instead of blowing your nose forcefully, wipe it gently. Remember that strong pressure in your mouth can go through your eustachian tube to your ear and disrupt the eardrum as it rebuilds the tissue. If an eardrum perforation does not heal on its own, your doctor may recommend closing it surgically. Closing a perforated eardrum may improve hearing, prevent frequent ear infections, and reduce tinnitus or ringing in the ear. Surgically closing a perforated eardrum may also prevent a condition called cholesteatoma. This is a cyst made of skin tissue in the middle ear that can cause middle ear infections and damage the structure of the ear. For swimmers who lose their balance when water goes through their perforated eardrum, the surgery may allow them to swim again.
If a person who has hearing loss is not a swimmer and does not have recurring ear infections, the doctor may recommend a hearing aid instead of surgery. Earplugs help protect the middle ear from contamination while bathing. If your doctor recommends repairing your eardrum, he or she will recommend the appropriate procedure for you. This could be a simple procedure in the doctor's office where the edges of the perforation are stimulated to grow again with special drugs. In these cases, a piece of paper is put over the hole to act as a bridge for the new tissue to grow on. Your doctor may recommend surgery in the hospital operating room under general or local anesthesia. This is called tympanoplasty. During this procedure, the surgeon places a tissue patch across the eardrum hole. Like the paper patch, the tissue patch acts as a bridge where tissue can grow and heal the eardrum. The source of the tissue can be muscle, vein, or fat from your body. Tympanoplasty is often successful in closing the tear or hole permanently and restoring hearing. It is done on an outpatient basis, meaning you can go home the same day. Procedure Tympanoplasty is an outpatient procedure, which means patients usually go home after the procedure. It can be done under local or general anesthesia. In general anesthesia, the patient is asleep. In local anesthesia, the patient is awake but doesn't feel pain. The ear surgeon makes an incision through the ear canal. If the surgeon can't see the hole in the eardrum, he or she may make an incision behind the ear to access the perforated eardrum. A tympanoplasty is a two-part procedure. The surgeon must first prepare the graft material and then prepare the eardrum for inserting the graft. The graft is the material the surgeon uses to patch the hole. This material acts as a bridge for the cells of the eardrum to regrow over the tear. The surgeon can get graft material from several places on your body. The most common place graft material is taken from for tympanoplasty is the postauricular fascia. This is the covering of the muscle tissue from behind the ear. The surgeon makes a small incision behind the ear to take tissue to use for the graft. Ask your doctor where he or she plans to get your graft tissue from. Next, the surgeon inserts the graft and covers the eardrum hole. This is done with the help of an operating microscope to enlarge the view of the eardrum and structures around it. That is why this surgery is called microsurgery. The ear surgeon puts special gel foam around the graft to help hold it in place. The whole procedure takes about one hour. If the surgeon finds that one or more of the three very small bones of the inner ear need repair, the ear surgeon may decide to repair them during the same procedure or later. This may include putting the small bones back in their normal positions if they have moved into a different position. Small artificial or prosthetic ossicles may also be used to replace broken bones. The incisions are then stitched back together. Usually, the stitches just melt away and do not have to be removed later. Risks and Complications Tympanoplasty is a relatively safe procedure. However, like any surgical procedure, it includes risks and complications. Knowing about these risks may help you notice them early. Risks of surgery are related to anesthesia, surgery in general, and this specific procedure. Tympanoplasty may be done under local or general anesthesia. Risks of anesthesia in general include an allergic reaction to the anesthetic drug. Tell your doctor if you have any allergies. Risks of general anesthesia include nausea, vomiting, urinary retention, cut lips, chipped teeth, sore throat, and headache. More serious but rare risks of general anesthesia include heart attacks, strokes, and pneumonia. Your anesthesiologist will discuss these risks with you and ask you if you are allergic to certain medications. Blood clots in the legs can occur due to inactivity during and after the surgery. These usually show up a few days after surgery. They cause the leg to swell and hurt. Blood clots can become dislodged from the leg and go to the lungs where they will cause shortness of breath, chest pain, and possibly death. It is extremely important to let your doctors know if any of these symptoms occur. Sometimes the shortness of breath can happen without warning. Getting out of bed shortly after surgery may help decrease the risk of blood clots in the legs. Risks related to surgery in general include infection, bleeding, and a skin scar. These are rare. If the graft is taken from behind the ear, the incision scar is usually not noticeable. The risk of bleeding is rare during this procedure. 
If you take blood thinners or aspirin-containing products, you will be instructed to stop taking them seven days before the procedure. Ask your doctor. Taking such products can increase the risk of bleeding during or after the procedure. After your procedure, your doctor will tell you when it is safe to restart these medications. Your doctor may give you an antibiotic before the surgery as well as after the surgery. This antibiotic prevents infection. Use it as prescribed by the doctor. Risks specific to this procedure include a deterioration of hearing, which is rare. Total loss of hearing is possible, but very rare. Patients who have tinnitus or ringing in the ear should notice improvement after the perforation is repaired. However, it is possible that the tinnitus may get worse after the procedure. This is very rare. Injury to a nerve is possible, but unlikely. This nerve is called corda tympani. It goes to the taste buds of the tongue. If this nerve is stretched or cut during the procedure, the patient may notice a slight salty or metallic taste to food. This is usually temporary and returns to normal in two to six months after the nerve regenerates. The most common risk of this procedure is the failure of the graft to work. This is unlikely but possible. Most tympanoplasties are successful. Failure of the repair can be either from an immediate infection during the healing period, from water getting into the ear, or from displacement of the graft. Following your post-procedure instructions, which are described in the next section, can increase your chances for a successful graft procedure. After surgery. After surgery, you will be taken to a recovery room for two to three hours where you will rest and then be given self-care instructions. You can play an important role in making your surgery successful by following your home care instructions, some of which are reviewed in this section. You may feel tired or dizzy for several hours. Rest as much as you can. You will not be able to drive home, so arrange to have a responsible adult drive you home and help you walk and climb stairs as needed for the next 24 hours. Usually there is not much pain after this procedure. The incision to take the graft tissue may be slightly painful. You will be given antibiotics and a mild pain reliever. Only use pain medicine as needed. It is normal to see drainage from your ear. It is usually reddish brown to brown in color. This may last a week or two, but should decrease with time and become clear. You may feel a little bit dizzy and imbalanced right after this procedure. This should go away in about a week or two. You might also hear ringing or buzzing in your ear. This also usually goes away in about a week or two. Your doctor will schedule a follow-up visit with you to make sure the graft was successful and you have an improvement in your hearing. The doctor may also take out some of the packing gel foam holding the graft. After the follow-up visit, the doctor will ask that you continue to keep water out of your ear and not blow your nose forcefully for three to four months. After that, water can be allowed to enter the ear, and you can even go swimming. You should call your doctor if you have an infection in your ear or in the incision behind your ear. Signs of infection include fever of 101 degrees Fahrenheit or greater, increased ear drainage, foul-smelling drainage, increased redness in the suture line, or pain that is not controlled by medication. Self-care Between your procedure and your follow-up visit, you should follow these instructions to help ensure the success of your procedure. 1. Use the antibiotic as prescribed. The eardrum prescribed to you contains an antibiotic to help fight infections. 2. Keep water away from your ear. This is very important for preventing infection. This may last for 4 months. 3. Do not forcefully blow your nose. For at least three weeks, do not close your mouth when you blow your nose. Wipe your nose with a tissue without forcefully blowing out. The pressure created when you blow your nose with your mouth closed goes through the eustachian tube to the ear and can displace the graft. After three weeks, you should be able to blow your nose gently. 4. Do not hold your nose to avoid sneezing. Sneeze with your mouth wide open. If you have to sneeze, open your mouth and let the air pressure go out of your mouth. Closing your mouth risks displacing the graft. 5. Prevent yourself from getting a cold or flu. You should avoid getting the flu or cold. These can cause your eustachian tube to plug up and the air pressure in the ear will not be balanced, which may displace the graft. Wash your hands frequently and avoid friends with the cold or flu. 6. Manage your allergies. 
If you have allergies or if you get the cold or flu, see your doctor for decongestants. 7. Do not lift anything very heavy. Your doctor will tell you how much weight you can lift. You should avoid heavy physical labor and lifting. Do not participate in sports or vigorous activity for two weeks. 8. If you smoke, stop smoking. This is hard to do, but it is important between the surgery and your follow-up appointment to stop smoking in order to help the graft take. 9. Keep your incision clean. Follow good hygiene by washing hands, washing clothes, and taking care of your incision as asked by your doctor. 10. Keep your outer ear clean. You can wipe out any discharge that comes out of your ear with a wet tissue. Do not force pressure in the ear canal or let water in. The doctor will let you know when you can stop following these self-care instructions. Your doctor will give you additional instructions that are specific to your medical condition. Your doctor will also tell you when you can start taking your medications again and go back to work. If you like this video, please like and share. For similar videos, subscribe to our channel. Conclusion The eardrum helps us hear and protects the inner ear. It can get perforated by repeated middle ear infections. Injury, loud noises, and external air or water pressure could tear it too. If an eardrum perforation does not heal by itself, your doctor may recommend closing it with surgery. Tympanoplasty is an outpatient surgical procedure that is very successful at closing a perforated eardrum and restoring hearing. Like any surgical procedure, tympanoplasty has risks and complications. You should know about them before you decide to have the procedure. Knowing about potential complications may also help you find them early and treat them. Closing a perforated eardrum may improve hearing, prevent frequent infections, reduce ringing in the ear, and prevent cholesteatoma. Thanks to advances in microsurgery, tympanoplasty is usually a very successful procedure. Thank you for using Explain.